Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am happy to be with you. I hope you have something fun planned for your weekend or, you know, relaxing or whatever type of weekend you want to have. I I hope you have some of that in store for you. My day has been pretty laid back. I made pizza for my parents, homemade pizza. One of my favorite things to do, and they always appreciate it, so that's kind of gratifying. And yeah, like I said, just a pretty laid-back day, and not much to report from from the parents' house here in rural Montana. Well, of course, I do have one great thing to report, and that is, of course, another delightful author that I got to speak with recently. Today, I am speaking with Jody S. Rosenfeld about her book, Closer to Fine. I mentioned the Indigo Girls song at the end of the last episode, and it's been stuck in my head again, of course, but if you aren't a fan of the Indigo Girls, or maybe you've never heard of them, or maybe you have heard of them, but you don't know Closer to Fine, anyway, you should go listen to Closer to Fine, because it is a delightful song to just belt out in the car or wherever you happen to be. Just belt it out. In fact, uh, Jody includes a bit of the lyrics from the song at the beginning of the book. There's more than one answer to these questions, pointing me in a crooked line. The less I seek my source for some definitive, the closer I am to fine. And closer to uh, the closer I am to find is is the best part to belt out <laughs> that, that that's, that's that's one of my go-to belting out indigo girl songs at any rate let's get to the book the back of the book says closer to fine is the story of Rachel Levine a young Jewish bisexual woman finding her adult footing in a world full of uncertainties Rachel has many teachers along the way a stubborn grandfather, a progressive rabbi, a worldly girlfriend, a wise supervisor, and an insightful therapist. But in the end, it is her own anxiety that is the best teacher of all. As Rachel learns that accepting that which she cannot control is the mark of true growth, she becomes ever more connected to the people who matter most in her life. So, as I said, that is the back of the book, uh, Closer to Fine by Jody S. Rosenfeld. It starts out in 2019, but then most of it takes place throughout flashbacks to Rachel's time in grad school in the mid-90s. And I loved that because, although I was not in grad school at the same time, I was, was just starting college about this time, it still felt very, very familiar to me, a lot of the experiences that Rachel goes through. In fact, um, some of my own experiences in college with religion and the way things were changing and the LGBTQI plus community, I could definitely resonate with in this story. And just, I mean, some of the fashion, of course, some of the some of the music and everything. I, I, I enjoyed taking that little trip down memory lane. But I also really enjoyed Rachel as a character, as someone who, while of a similar age to me at that time, is very different from me in a lot of ways. So that was fun to experience that time period through her eyes, opposite sides of the country. You know, I was in Montana at the time. She's on the East Coast. Um, Jewish. I'm Lutheran. <laughs> She's bisexual. I'm straight. But still, just uh, I went to a very 
it was called crunchy then. Do we still say crunchy? Anyway, in the 90s, it was crunchy. It was a very crunchy liberal arts school in Montana. And so it was just really fun to revisit that time period. But let's go ahead and turn now to the interview with Jody, so she can tell you more about the book and the writing process and everything went in that went into it. Again, the book is called Closer to Fine. The author is Jody S. Rosenfeld. Hi, Jody. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. And I'm excited to talk about your book, Closer to Fine. Before we get to the book, though, uh, if you could share a little bit about yourself so my listeners can get to know you a bit. Sure, absolutely. Um, I live outside of Philadelphia near Valley Forge, um, Valley Forge National Park. And I'm actually originally from Connecticut, where I grew up um, on an apple farm. And I left Connecticut when I went to Tufts University, which is outside of Boston. Um, and I lived in Somerville, which is the the basic location of the novel. So most of the book takes place in Somerville, Massachusetts. And that's somewhere I lived um, in my 20s. Uh, and after college, I, I while living there, I stayed um, in the Boston area and received a doctorate in um, clinical psychology from the Massachusetts School of Professional Psychology, which is actually now called uh, William James College. And um, I've lived in Baltimore, Maryland for a while. And now here I am outside of Philadelphia, where I've been for about 15 years. And I would say, um, to describe myself, I, I often say that I wear a lot of hats. So um, I'm the mom of two awesome teenagers. That's part of my identity. I'm, like I said, a clinical psychologist, and I have a small private practice. Um, and I recently became a rabbinical student, which means I'm studying to become a rabbi. And I, I just started a program at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College here in Philadelphia. Um, and then I'm really excited to be here with you today as an author, wearing an author hat, that's been writing closer to fine was really a passion project of mine for you know what almost turned out to be a decade, um, and I'm so thrilled to finally be you know seeing it be birthed into the world has been really exciting. Yeah, I bet um, that's that's wonderful. You do wear a lot of hats, so yes. You you were saying that you. Tomorrow is a school day for you as well, so you're starting your studies tomorrow, is that correct? I I am. I just had orientation last week and got to know my cohort, who I'll be spending lots of time with over the next six years, um, and classes do start tomorrow, so that's really, yeah, it's a very exciting time for me as well. Yeah. My, my teenagers and I get to, you know, pack our lunches and leave in the morning at the same time. <laughs> and uh, they should take a first day of school picture of you. Oh, that's a great idea. I'll make one of those little signs that says first day. <laughs> I love it. Um, so the book is called Closer to Fine. And first of all, let me just say thanks for getting that stuck in my head. for the. <laughs> oh, anytime, anytime. It's a great song by a great duo. I'm a big Indigo Girls fan. And um, it's funny, the title has, you know, went through many iterations over the course of writing the book. But Several of them were quotes from the song, and they were getting kind of wordy, and they were sort of too long to use as a title. And finally, I just said, I'm just going to call it Closer to Fine. It's just um, just sort of captures um, what I was trying to say, but also, you know, makes a, you know, def in deference to the wonderful song by the Indigo Girls. And I was, you know, when I saw the when I saw the cover when I first got the book, I, my first thought was, oh, I wonder if that's an Indigo Girls reference, and then you open it up. Uh -huh. and Yep. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. It okay. sure is. Um, can you share the premise of the story? Sure, sure. Um, so Closer to Fine is about um, a young woman named Rachel. She is in her mid-20s, and she's embarking on what today we might call the task of adulting. Um, but the book actually takes place in the, in the 1990s, and I don't think any of us said adulting back then. I don't think that's a term she would have used. Um, but Rachel is coming into her adult self as a young professional, um, as a Jewish woman, as a bisexual woman, as a romantic partner, um, and as an adult daughter and granddaughter. So throughout the novel, she she actually finds herself in the somewhat unusual uh, situation of becoming housemates with her grandfather, her Zeta. Um, and much of the novel revolves around their sort of shifting intergenerational connection. Um, but ultimately, I'd like to think of Closer to Fine as a story that 
looks at the question of how we deal with uncertainty in our lives, how we manage the anxiety that that uncertainty brings up for all of us um, in adulthood. And I think different people in Rachel's life respond to their anxiety in different ways, some through avoidance, some through denial, things like that. But um, really, it's her journey into how she wants to learn to manage her own anxiety as she becomes an adult. So there you have a little bit more of an introduction to Closer to Fine by Jody S. Rosenfeld. We're going to go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. When we'll be coming back, when we come back, excuse me, we'll be talking a little bit more about the 90s as the time period. And I'm, of course, going to go off about the 90s again, just to warn you. But uh, we'll be talking about that time period and the decision to set it in that time period. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Hey, it's Sarah here to tell you about the Infinity Pro by Conair with the Knot Doctor all in one dryer brush. I just took this traveling with me and it is amazing in that it is a three-in-one tool. I didn't have to pack extra equipment with me just for my hair on this trip. It has a hair dryer. It is a volumizer. It is a detangler. It can do all of these things in one step. The large oval brush creates glam, waves, the bristles painlessly remove knots as you dry and style. It uses ionic technology to create a frizz-free look effortlessly. Speaking of that frizz-free look, there are three heat settings plus a cool setting that will lock in your look for effortless looking hairstyles. It's got a bonus volumizing attachment included that gives you added lift at the roots and the removable attachments make storage at home or away super easy. Like I said, I just traveled with it and it was so easy and so convenient. If you would like your very own Infinity Pro by Conair with the Knot Doctor all-in-one dryer brush, simply go to conair.com and search dryer brush. Again, that is conair, C-O-N-A-I-R dot com and search dryer brush. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with Jody S. Rosenfeld. We are talking about her novel, Closer to Fine. Let's return to the interview. Yeah, and I love that it takes place in the 90s because it's uh, it's a little earlier than, she's in grad school when I, about the same time I was in college, but it's mm. just so fun to revisit some of the things that were going on in my own um, my own denomination, my own church life about at, at that time around LGBTQ plus issues. Um, sure. The, the alphabet wasn't that long at that time, but it was, no, it really wasn't. And, right. That's an interesting point. Yeah. It was, it was really interesting to see it uh, from a Jewish perspective and to, and to see the generational differences because I, I remember doing kind of going through similar things in my own college years uh, and just revisiting, you know, that time period. I like that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. Of, I, I make a lot of 90s references in terms of music and things they, you know, things we used to say in the 90s. And um, it was fun to do that. It was fun to really locate the story in a particular moment in time. And I, I kind of think that it, it, you know, I've been asked this question before, like, could this story take place in a different time period? You know, could it take place in present day? And um, one of the, one of the things that I 
came to mind when I was asked that question originally was it would be a very different story if it took place today. Um, one, for the reason you named, like the what was happening in the LGBT, you know, Q plus community at that time was that it was really about LGB. It was really you if you weren't straight, you were re- you really needed to pick a box. You were either um, mm-hmm. completely gay or lesbian or you were bisexual. And that was kind of the the norm at the time and so and that affects Rachel in a lot of ways you know she's sort of coming to terms with what it means to be bisexual and how she defines that what it means in her family and what it means you know in her religious community um you know I don't mention trans folks at all in in the book and really that's because in the 90s the LGBT the LGB community wasn't talking about trans issues the way the way they are now it really was not nearly as inclusive as it is now um so i think there would be some really interesting things that would be different if it took place you know say today right yeah i yeah. agree uh, and so uh what was your initial inspiration for the book i would say um you know it's not autobiographical per se but but absolutely my own life and my own experiences you know it's i didn't have to do a lot of research for this book because the research was really my own um my own process my own kind of looking back on what my 20s were like and while the things that happened to rachel to the protagonist um many of them are very different than things that happened to me I really used my own experience as a young Jewish woman trying to find my voice and a, a you know com- I came out as bisexual in the 90s and really using my own experiences in those ways to inform the character. Um so I think it's it was just about really reflecting on on that decade for myself. Mhm. And I appreciate that there's that there's just the character of Rachel is is complex. It, it's complex in that you know she's a young Jewish woman. She identifies as bisexual, but it's not complex in that she's just a person, right? Right. So right. You see this person that's struggling with identity and 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 kind of growing into that adulthood, um, but she is she's she can represent people who may not see themselves in books all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and I think that's both, I think it's both true that she represents like, you know, somewhat of an underrepresented voice um, among characters that we find in novels, but at the same time, there's a universality about her. And at least that's my hope as an author is, you know, when I first started writing the character and writing the novel, my thought was like, oh, you know, LGBT people are really going to resonate with this, you know, with this novel, or Jewish people are really going to, you know, be pulled to this story, um, or people who grew up in the 90s. I really sort of started off thinking that you had to have, have something in common with Rachel to really get her story. And by the end of writing it, I didn't feel that way anymore. I felt like, you know, her story, um, you know, part, there is a love story and it, it, as part of the plot. And I think there are just commonalities and and things that are true about young relationships no matter who they're between right so no matter who the gender what the gender is of the two people in the relationship um, there's just a lot of universal experience that I think comes through and and in terms of the religious piece you know really the struggle there for Rachel is about tradition versus change and that is something we struggle with in all religious practice I think you know religions are very you know have have very traditional um, historic roots and I think you know one of the things anyone who practices um, any major religion grapples with is you know how do I be a modern person in today's world and um you know and practice something that is so ancient you know how do those two things work together and and often they're in conflict so in the end i sort of came to think um you know you didn't have to be jewish and you didn't have to be bisexual um to get rachel like i think her her struggles are hopefully more universal than that in my tradition we call it the seven last words of a dying church we've never done it that way before um, uh huh. That's a great. That's actually. I love that. We've never done it that way before. That's. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. And and in closer to fine, you know, like I said, Rachel's living with her with her Zeta. Zeta is Yiddish for grandfather. And um, 
you know, he really represents the way it's always been done. His, yes. his way of practicing and his way of being in the world is very traditional. Um, and so he likes to do things the way we've always done them. Um, and she really represents change and, and sort of an evolution and wanting to do things differently. And so the, the conflict between the two of them, you know, like I said, I think in any religious tradition or even, even outside of religious traditions, even in families, right? You know, across generations, yep. there are ways that, each new generation challenges their parents um, with newness, you know, thing, you know, things that they didn't do in their day. And so there's a lot of that in their, in the relationship between the two of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even with Bill's mom, you see that some, because um, her, her mom really struggles with Rachel's sexual identity um, and to coming in coming to terms with it, because that's, you know, that's just not what she did as a, you know she sure up. sure she doesn't really right she doesn't really understand it and she um is a very anxious person you know she's a very anxious character um and you see that she's a minor character in the sense that she's not present in the novel um so much but she's actually a very important character because Rachel really carries her mother's voice around inside her head um and much of what drives her is you know trying to um, you know, trying to manage the guilt she feels about, about, you know, hurting her mother, um, in the way that she perceives she has. Yeah. 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 Time for the second break of the podcast. When we come back, Jody and I will be discussing Rachel as the main character. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC book review podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with Jody S. Rosenfeld. We are talking about her novel, Closer to Fine. Let's go ahead and return to the interview with Jody. You've talked a little bit about Rachel as the main character, but can you uh, just say a little bit more about what else you think about her as that character will resonate with readers? Um, you know, I... I think there's something about her being in her 20s. I, I have a real belief that, and, and some of this comes out of my work as a psychologist, that, you know, our 20s are just, to me, a fascinating decade, right? There's so much change that happens in those years. And I think one of the reasons is because for most of us, up until the time we're in our young 20s, we've been students, right? We've, we've, our identity has been as students since, since preschool, right? So we've always, you know, we've lived by an academic calendar. We've had our summers off. We've known what grade we're going into next. And we sort of know who we are in that way. And then there's something that happens when you graduate college where there's sort of a floundering, I think, and sort of a feeling of like, what do I do next? Who am I? And even though Rachel does start a graduate program, Um, she's really sort of thrust into the adult world in a way that feels really new to her. And I I remember myself, people saying to me like, oh, welcome to the real world, you know? And I, I found that sort of terrifying. I thought, you know, well, where, where, then where have I been living for the past, you know, 22 years? Um, But there's this sense that when you enter your twenties, you know, you're sort of, 
it's that adulting thing. It's that figuring out how to be an adult in the world and, and who you're going to be. And so I think the fact that that's the age that Rachel is throughout the novel, you know, she's in her mid twenties. Um, I think that speaks a lot to, to anyone who's either been that age or is that age, or, you know, I think um, it speaks to young adults you know, especially, but, but even those of us who are older and can look back and think about what we were like in our twenties. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And that identity piece, I think plays a, a big role in the book because even at the beginning, she has a conversation with friends about, you know, now that we're at college, what is our identity? It's harder to pinpoint that um, um, right. out of at college. Uh, did you go into the writing thinking it would be, it would have those pieces of identity or did they kind of come out of the writing process? I think that, um, I think I thought it would a lot about the writing process came sort of as I was doing the writing, a lot of the plot and, and the ways that which the plot turned and changed. I, I often didn't know what was going to happen in a scene until I wrote it. Um, but that piece, the piece about, exploring identity. I think that was really at the heart of what I wanted to do when I started. Um, just really wanting to explore, you know, a young woman's experience at that time in her life and figuring out just exactly who she is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in, you, you mentioned plot. How about character development? Did you have the main characters or even some of the secondary characters kind of fleshed out before you started or did that also develop as you wrote? I think it really developed as I wrote, you know, I'm not a writer by trade, right? Or, or by, you know, I didn't, I never, I took a little bit of creative writing. I took some poetry writing in college, but it was never, um, it was never my career. It was never really what I was trained to do. And, you know, I'd heard authors talk about their writing throughout my life, like, you know, going to different author talks. And some writers will talk about, you know, having a very clear outline before they begin or having their characters really fleshed out before they begin. And other writers will talk about sort of discovering who their characters are um, as they write. And I really didn't know what it would be like for me, but I found that it really was the latter for me, that my style ended up being um, the characters actually taught me about themselves in the end, you know, so in early drafts, you know, I was sort of surprised to learn certain things about them. And then as I, you know, edited and, and did more drafts, I, I had more of a handle of who they, on who they were. Um, but initially, no, initially they, they really, they sometimes surprised me <laughs> with things they would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you ever find yourself kind of interacting with them from your psychologist point of view? Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's a lot of psychology in the book. So one of the things that really gets, I think, explored in the novel is the therapeutic relationship and from both sides of the couch. So, you know, you get to see Rachel training to become a therapist and what that looks like and how she works with her supervisor to, to learn how to be a therapist. And then she also um, starts therapy with a new therapist. And so we get to see her experience as the client. Um, and so my own work, both my own work in my own therapy and my own work in working with clients informed that very much. Um, and I'm just, it's, that's a relationship that deeply fascinates me. You know, it's, there's one part where um, Rachel is talking with some of her, her um, colleagues in her graduate program. And she's saying like, it's so, it's so difficult to be in these relationships where, you know, we're not seen, you know, we, we are, we know someone, so you know your client so intimately, you come to know all the details of their life, you come to know them so deeply and, and actually build quite a bond with them. And yet, you, you really can't say a whole lot about yourself, you know, your own needs are not part of the picture. Um, and she sort of struggles with that. It's, it's, it's a different, you know, it's, it's very new for her. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of my experience as a psychologist definitely informed that piece. Mm -hmm. And you said earlier that a lot of a lot of it is from you know your own life experiences. But were there any types of research that you found yourself needing to do? Um, you know, more as reminders than anything else. You know, trying to remember like, you know, 
this was before the internet, right? So another thing that's really particular to, to setting the story in the mid nineties is that it's pre-internet and that, that affects a lot of things that happen in terms of um, Rachel feeling sort of isolated around you. Know, she has questions that today you would just jump on Google and figure it out. You know, there are things she, she wants to know about, you know, feminist Jewish practice and, and things about women in Judaism that today is available at our fingertips, that, that kind of information, that kind of access to community. Um, and she didn't have that. And, and it's funny, you know, after we, we come to, take for granted what the internet provides us. You know, I've, I've almost forgotten what it was like to live before that time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had to, so any research I did was more about reminding myself like, oh yeah, what, what year, like what was going on in 1995? Like people were starting to get um, AOL, like, you know, and, and you know, like you've got mail. That was like <laughs> the closest we had. Right. And there were like maybe some chat rooms through, through America online, but it was definitely pre, um, internet the way we know it now. And so I had to sort of go back and remind myself like, oh, what would have been available to her at this time? And and what were cell phones like? Did we have cell phones? No, we had clunky car phones, you know, that you had to plug into the cigarette lighter in the car, you know. Um, and so I, I would say less research than reminding, reminding myself what, what was and wasn't true at that time period. There's a scene fairly early in the book where she her her the the person she's having lunch with offers her her cell phone so she can call her Zeta <laughs> and she's right. like I use it at the table can I can I do that is that right right, right. well what's funny is so so that's actually an early um, dating scene which is great it was really fun to write and Liz who ends up becoming Rachel's girlfriend um, has been living in France and. So it was true that that in Europe they were always a, they were always a little bit ahead of us in terms of cell phone technology. So when she came back from France, you know, she had this little cell phone in her bag and whipped it out of the table, and and Rachel was aghast, like, oh my god, I can't talk on the phone in the middle of a restaurant. Like, I, how could I do that? And she's like, oh, in France, everyone does it, you know. And I thought, yeah, I remember that time where you know no one would have thought to do something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And final break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll find out if Jody is planning on writing any more books. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Pets bring such joy to our lives, and the GSMC Pets Podcast is here to share in that joy. We'll tell stories of pets finding their forever homes, acting in unexpected ways, being helpful, or just being silly. Whether you love dogs, cats, llamas, reptiles, fish, or you've never met an animal you didn't like, the GSMC Pets Podcast is for you. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Jody S. Rosenfeld. This was a passion project, you said, but uh, mm. is it something that you want to do more of? Do you want to write more books? Are you writing more books? Well, at the moment, I'm not. You know, I'll never say never. Um but certainly starting rabbinical school is taking up all of my time. But one of the great things actually about starting rabbinical school is there's a lot of opportunity for writing and there's a lot of opportunity for creative writing. So um, the particular denomination that I'm, that I'm connected with reconstructionism um, is really interested in like creating new ritual and new liturgy and like really expanding um, sort of our creative influences into how we practice. And so I think there's actually going to be a lot of space in there for me to do some creative writing, which feels really great. Um, and I also, I love writing poetry and, and there's space for that as well. So that's probably the, the kind of writing I'll be doing for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. And what actually led you to writing for publication? You know, you've mentioned creative writing and poetry, but um, what what led to this passion project and getting it published? 
So I think um, I think it was just always a dream, honestly, Sarah. Like I think that when probably going back to my twenties, you know, there are certain things that you sort of put on your bucket list. Again, I don't think we used the expression bucket list back then, but um, you know, there were things where I said, like, you know, someday I'd like to do this, and someday wouldn't it be great to publish a novel someday? And and then over the years, the story bits and pieces of the story sort of were sitting in my brain for, for many years. Like, oh, I, I do think I write a, I want to write a book one day, and I think it might be about this. And what happened was about eight years ago, I was on a bike ride with a friend, and I told her this. I said, you know, I've had these ideas swimming around in my head, and, you know, at some point I'd like to write write this book. And she just looked at me and she said, why don't you start writing it? Like, well, maybe it's time for it to be on paper. And I I kind of went like, oh, <laughs> Right. Why Why do I keep talking about this as some future endeavor? Maybe, maybe the best time is now. Um, and it was just her asking that simple question that sort of shook me into starting. Um, and then, you know, and then it was like, you know, a, a good eight or nine year process from, from that point of just deciding to start because, you know, there were lots of, there were different editors along the way and different drafts along the way, um, and times where I, you know, put it down for six months and then picked it up again, um, which was actually really helpful because, you know, it, when you write something, you, you're just way too close to it. Sometimes you need to create a little distance before you can see it more clearly. Um, but yeah, so eventually that's that's that was the path. And from that experience, would you have advice? for other people who have that idea in their head and, and are thinking about maybe they want to write that that isn't a book? I, I do. I think, I think I would just be really encouraging. You know, I would say you don't have to be a career author to, to write a book. You know, um, it might be harder. It might be, you might not have the same experience that others do who, who, you know, specifically studied um, writing, but you know, if you have a story in you, tell it, right? And then and and then just, you know, let it go where it goes. I think there are many more opportunities today for publication than there ever were, you know? So there's big publishing houses, right, that we all know about, like big New York City publishing houses. And then there's self-publishing, which anyone can do. Um, and then there are all sorts of small indie presses, which is what I used, a, a small independent press called She Writes Press, which um, really champions women writers, especially debut novel, deb debut writers. Um, and there's all sorts of new small independent presses that, are, that have different specialties or are interested in new voices. And I think, you know, I would just say go for it. There's no reason not to. No. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. And then you're about to start uh, rabbinical school, so probably your personal reading is going to go way down. But when you have, <laughs> what are your? Do you have favorite authors and genres that you turn to? I do. I do. I read um, mostly contemporary fiction. Um, and let me think. Some of my well, Barbara King's Oliver, I think, is probably my very favorite author. Um, I also love uh, Jonathan Safran Foer and Nicole Krauss. Um, and I do read a lot of poetry, and I'm a, a big, huge Mary Oliver fan, um, which m I, I think most – I don't know that I've ever met a reader of poetry who doesn't love Mary Oliver, but she's, she um, is sort of the queen of poetry or was the queen of poetry, you know, of blessed memory. Um, an Irish poet I love is Padraig Otuma. He actually does a, um, a podcast through through the On Being Project called um, Poetry Unbound, which is a great way to learn about different poets. Hmm. And um, yeah, just I, I really do love reading for pleasure. And you're right, there probably will be less of it <laughs> in my near future. Yes, you're and going to assume you're going to be reading a lot more ancient texts. Or right, more. An lots of ancient texts. That's oh. true. Yeah. And then do you have a website? Where can people find you on social media? All of those good details. Sure. So I'm not great at social media, but I do have a website, and it's just jodyrosenfeld.com, um, J-O-D-I-R-O-S-E-N-F-E-L-D. And um, I try to keep up with that, and I, I use that um, for a couple different things. I, I use it for um, learning about my psychology practice. I have a section on the book and – author events, and then um, 
some stuff about rabbinic studies also. So it's all all in one place. Um, and I would love people to check it out. If if people read the book and are so moved and and want to write a review on Amazon, that's always a wonderful thing. Um, I don't think you don't have to have bought the book on Amazon. And in fact, I always encourage people to support their local independent bookstores. Mm-hmm. Um, but reviews are great because it just helps give the book more visibility and and get it out there. Um, but yeah, I I encourage people to to please, you know, read it and, and let me know what you think. And and also, you know, my email and stuff is, is available on the website. Con, you know, contact me if you want to talk about it or if you have questions or whatever. I think that's always a fun thing to do to hear from people who've read it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jody, we've talked about a variety of things in relationship to the book, but is there anything that we haven't covered during our time together that you were hoping to highlight? Mm. That's a hard question because I don't think so, but I'm sort of I'm sort of racking through my brain. What have we talked about? And I, um, no, I think I just you know I I just want to say thank you in advance to any future readers. You know, it's it's always a little scary to put your voice out there into the world. Um, it's been really exciting, but but certainly not without um, some fearful moments. And you know. It's and it's a book that I hope um, I hope people enjoy. I hope people find meaning in. Again, I'd love to hear from you if if you're a reader. Um, and I just really appreciate Sarah the time to talk with you and and be on your show. Well, I appreciate that you took the time as as well, especially now with with things you know ramping up for the fall and school year and everything. I thank you so much for finding time to talk to me. No problem. It's an honor to do so. Thank you once again to Jody for joining me, talking about Closer to Fine. As I said, I really enjoyed this book as I raveled, raveled? <laughs> I was going to say ranted and um, and bab. I don't even know what I was going to say, but as I raveled on at the beginning of the podcast, <laughs> I really loved the time setting and it just took me back to so many memories of my own college experiences and things that were happening in my own life at the time. So I, I really appreciated that and I very much appreciated Jody's representations of Rachel and her own struggles and her issues, not only with the things that were happening within Judaism at the time, but her own trying to figure out, you know, what it meant to be a bisexual Jewish woman, also what it meant to deal with her own anxiety and going through therapy while also becoming a therapist, just all those different layers. I really, really appreciated it and could resonate with so many of them, even though, as I said, There are a lot of things that Rachel and I don't have in common, but, you know, that's the wonderful thing about books and characters. There's almost always something that you can find in common with the characters or the storylines in a book, even if it's completely, vastly different from your own experience. So thank you to Jody not only for talking to me, but for writing the book and uh, completing that passion project of hers. I hope that you will join me next time. I will be, we're switching from um, novel to sci-fi. I guess it's still a novel. Um, Anyway, we're switching to sci-fi. I'll be speaking with Richard Paulinelli. I'm going to try to get that out correctly. Um, Richard Paulinelli about his new sci-fi book, Alan's Way. Tune in to find out how it's certain authors answer to... Star Wars. And I say authors plural. So you'll have to tune in to find out why that is also the case. If you are a fan of this podcast, as always, please do follow on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I am trying to be more interactive and more interesting. But I do love when listeners hit me up with questions or comments, and I would love to hear from you about your thoughts on books. I love to hear everybody's thoughts on books. Also, if you could take a moment to give the podcast a review, whether that's starred or written, it helps to get this podcast out there to more people who love books, and that is always a good thing. Thank you so much for joining me. Please join me again next time. I hope you have a wonderful weekend, and I hope, as always, that that weekend involves plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks so much. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. 
part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.